Hi everyone, my name is Ian from Saskatoon branch and I'll be the moderator for this session presenting Ag Tech and the future of food. We have two great speakers in Marty and Darcy lined up to discuss this topic. Marty, aka Cowboy, is the Director of Industry and Stakeholder Relations at Farm Credit Canada, where he engages with national associates and officials and industry influencers to explore partnerships that add real value to the Canadian agricultural industry. Darcy, aka Farmer, is the Director of Farm Credit Canada's Ag Expert, where he leads a team that supports Canada's leading farm management technologies. Full bios for these two gentlemen, and the overview of Farm Credit Canada is available on the SIA website. And now I'll turn it over to Cowboy and Farmer to present Ag Tech and what's going on in the market and where does sustainability fit into the future of food. Gentlemen, over to yourselves. All right, thanks Ian. Uh, Darcy, I want to do a quick sound check. You can hear me okay? I can hear you okay, I'm good. All right, and I got you too. So thanks Ian. Um, it's actually kind of fun to do an intro like that with uh, cowboy and farmer nicknames. Uh, affectionately inside of FCC, that's how Darcy and I uh, call each other out in a big room. So, you know, in the spirit of so many webinars we've been doing this winter, it, you know, Darcy and I talked about this particular session. Like, you know, let's try something different. And I started hosting a podcast uh, this year as FCC kind of went to market in this podcast circuit. Thought, you know what, that podcasting formula is kind of a good one. So, Darcy and I thought. We're going to come at this from this session. We don't have slides to share. We don't have big data dumps, but we just have, I want a conversation about some of where we see the opportunities in the future in, in agriculture in, in many ways. And so we're going to cover a lot of ground. I encourage you to you know, bank your questions and flip them through the chat line and Ian will facilitate them at the end. Uh, but in the spirit of that, hopefully Darcy and I can find a little conflict in our conversation, as well as there's always some general alignment on where we're going to go. And so Darcy, I, you know, the first area is ag tech. Um, Maybe you can set the stage a little bit for the room just in your assignment at FCC and why when I say AgTech, I think of Darcy here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Marty. And I'm sure we'll get into some conflicting discussions. Um, I expect it anyways throughout throughout our hour together. But yeah, I, I am I'm Darcy Harif. I'm the director of Ag Expert here at Farm Credit Canada. And um, hopefully some or all of you have heard of Ag Expert before and are probably most familiar with our accounting platform. So we have uh, thousands and thousands of customers that have that have used the Ag Expert accounting platform over the years. Um, and then, you know, mostly, you know, in the past desktop software, most recently we've made a big push to, to move our applications to the cloud. Uh, and we have two main applications that, that I always talk about, Marty, and their, their accounting and field management uh, or in Ag Expert field. Um, and the reason, you know, and when I think of, of why do we offer these to the industry, it's, it's really to give farmers a solid and simple way to digitize, start digitizing their records. So we know, and, and I'm sure this crowd is uh, well aware that we're still seeing uh, stats where, you know, about 50% of Canadian farmers are still using pen and paper or Excel to manage their data and it's, um, or, to, or to manage their records. Not a bad way of doing it actually, but I think it really limits, it limits farmers going forward as, as farms get more complex or agriculture gets more complex to really um, utilize that data and use it in a way to make make decisions. So um, yeah, at, at Farm Credit Canada, we have, or at Ag Expert and my team, um, we have a couple of things we often talk about, solid and simple. So our applications, our platforms cannot be simple enough to use. Uh, when we think we have it cased and we, we have an easy solution, we always try to make it a little bit easier. Um, and they have to be reliable, they have to be solid. So, you know, farming's a 24 hour job most times and, um, when farms need to use or want to use our applications, they need to be available and they and they need to be, um, you know, need to be there for them. You know, okay. and, and the, the flip side for that too is, is we have an overarching use case on everything we build. We want farmers eventually to be able to enter their data once in any system and then be able to reuse it multiple times across multiple platforms to solve uh, different business processes and problems. Okay, we are going to come back to visit a little bit about that data stuff a little bit later. But, you know, of all this stuff you said, Darcy, for those of you that don't know me on the other end of this call, is my, I'm kind of the generalist at FCC. And I get a lot of my work is just trends and opportunities in the industry, but I get a lot of luxury to think about the future. So my world is kind of 10 years old all the time. And I had this epiphany this year, Darcy, that I actually think a lot of the technology in agriculture uh, left farmers behind. 
And it's kind of a provocative statement, but I always, I, I felt that the stuff that I was seeing coming through some of my uh, personal side of some work I do with Innovation SaaS was really forward thinking and um, digitized heavy. Yet I watched farmers kind of, as you said, only 50% have their records digitized. I watched broadband internet gaps. And, and so I have this, this hypothesis, the part of the gap in, in digitizing data is some of the tools are super complicated. Um, some of them don't solve a real problem for me as a farmer and you farm personally as well. And so I always like your perspective on this. So if I said this challenging statement that we left farmers behind on some of this, how would you respond? Yeah, I think uh, I think I think it's a it's a it's good insight, Marty. I see it a little bit differently, I guess. Um, and it's not that the technology has left farmers behind, because I think people in the egg industry, be it farmers, agronomists, bankers, like whoever, re crop input retailers, they'll adapt tech or adopt technology when there's a business case for it. And I think part of the problem with some of these technologies, and I think you hit on a few, some of them are very complex. So you you buy a tool, but you also need a consultant that comes with it uh, in order for you to use it. And that, you know that's not a bad model actually, and it works for you know it works for a lot of farmers. I'm just not sure it's going to have much success getting past that leading five or ten percent. Um, so I think you know that's I think farmers will adopt technology if there's a business case there, and I don't think you can make these applications simple enough. And that's a really, really hard, hard thing to do in, in software development is try to make something complex um, seem simple and, and easy. So, yeah, and I agree with you on that, Darcy. I, I think your raising good point is that lots of people are using all of the different platforms available. And, and I think our philosophy, I share yours, is simple. When something's complicated, try to go even simpler until you just can't get to the a lower common denominator. Um, you know, if, if I look about, um, if 50% say aren't digitized, we use that stat. Do you think we'll ever get there where we have, is an unrealistic goal to say every farm manages records digitally? It's, maybe that's an unrealistic expectation. Yeah, it might. I don't know if we'll ever get to 100%. Um, you know, that that said, when you, when you think about a decade out and you think about what agriculture is going to look like uh, a decade from now, I think um, we're going to get over that hump or that you know that gap in, in egg tech adoption and when we do it's it's going to be big uh, i do think we're going to see I, I can't predict when um i don't have a crystal ball but i do think this next generation of um egg entrepreneurs or farmers whatever you want to call them they kind of expect it like they kind of expect a digital tool or a phone app to help them in their day-to-day -day operation and and you know we're we're trying you know our tools uh, that we build it's you know, it, it's almost your first step and we don't, I don't think there's ever going to be a one platform that rules them all or one platform that a farmer can go to for everything. But I think um, having platforms that are connected and having platforms that where data can be shared across them is kind of the future. And I, yeah, I, I kind of think this next generation and the under 40 farmers, they're kind of going to be expecting it. And, you know, when they really take over the reins of the farm. Uh, well, I actually agree with you there. I think I think it's sort of a common expectation that everything the next generation is bringing forward is digitized. And, and uh, yeah, I, I see that. I, I've often said we're missing the Microsoft operating system of egg data, where there's a centralized point where everything's integrated. And I know I've talked with uh, our colleague Fred Wall about is, is the near term future about the consolidation of, of different tools is kind of our way as an industry to create that integration. Do you see this next near future where we're going to see more integration? Um, yeah, I think so. I, I look, maybe I'll answer your question in two ways. I think there's going to be some egg tech companies that take the consolidation approach. So they're going to buy and try to create the Microsoft Office tool, um, you know, to use your terminology. And then there's going to be others that um, kind of are more on the open side. And I think if you look at the egg expert, you know, we've kind of taken the, the position that Hey, there's going to be farmers that use three, four, five tools, you know, to, to manage their different business processes. Let's just make it easy for them to enter their data once on any of those systems and then be able to share it back and forth. That includes machine or IoT data, right? Like there's no, it, it's pretty hard to convince me as a farmer if I already have the data in my application. Right now, what I have to do is go re-enter it four or five different times as I want to reuse it 
for crop insurance or hail insurance or um, you know, looking at any other tools that I use. And I, I think the expectation, and I think we're going to get there quicker. So in the next five years where, yeah, you can, I can enter my data on egg expert field and I can share it with my provincial crop insurer, my hail insurer, or maybe an online commodity uh, brokerage or some type of secondary uh, insurance provider, you know, my agronomist, for instance, right? It, it, it should all work to, it should all work together to help me manage my farm easier. The, the intent being less time in the office, which is, you know, as, as everybody knows, not most farms, farmers uh, best time spent or they feel it's their best time spent, uh, get more time in the field, more time looking at what they're producing uh, and make the paperwork a little bit easier. Okay, I want to jump ahead now to this conversation about the future, kind of looking out in our industry 10 years. And I, I keep reflecting on this story that I was in BC, well, when we were still traveling, say 18 months ago. And... Um, Started to see about the price of land, 25,000 bucks an acre, 30, 40, 50,000 an acre. And, uh, and so maybe BC said, you know, in Saskatchewan, you guys are just coming to this era where BC did 30 years ago, where in Saskatchewan, we grew our farm operations through acquisition. We tend to grow the average farm size grew, and that was how we netted more money out of our operation. And they said in BC, we went a different route when land got so expensive, where we started to intensify or look for every efficiency or every opportunity inside efficiency. And I, I don't know, that always stuck with me about this idea that the next level of thinking that we might be coming into in, in Western Canadian agriculture is this idea of efficiency and how it fits in. Like, where do you see that? You know, do you agree with this statement that someone in BC challenged me with or do you see it differently? That's a good question, actually. I don't know if I'm the best. I, I have to answer it with half my farmer hat maybe and half my, uh, half my FCC hat, but um i have a personal opinion that if you're farming your goal you know your goal should be to make as as much money or in any business I, I i always say farming but in any business your goal is to maximize your capital so you want your best return on investment as you possibly can get and that means um you have to do things that you know that maximize that that output however it be some people focus on expenses some people focus on the income side um probably the best operators focus on both but yeah, I do think there's there might be something there, Marty, especially as we see, you know, land prices in Saskatchewan for the for what we can produce on our land. Um, they're getting out there where, you know, it's hard to base the price of the land on what you produce. Right. You have to look at it more of a, as a whole farm approach almost. So when, you know, some of this land might be getting priced out of certain size operations. I know my where my operation size probably I'm priced out of most land that goes for sale in my area, but there's ways I can do to make more each acre, or more out of each acre, get more efficient, or or do things differently. Yeah. So I don't know if that, I, I don't know if it's going to go one way or the other, but it's probably going to go both ways, right? Where farms get to a certain size or scale, and they're going to be forced to, you know, to get more efficient as mo as any company would. Be, right? Yeah, I, I agree with you there. It's the mature the maturation of any business would start to look at both top and bottom line um, yeah. to drive to that. Um, I actually lately have not been subscribing to the theory that land in your particular area is so expensive it doesn't pay for itself. Not that that's not true. It's that every region of this country I go to, they they say land's too expensive to buy it on its on its production merit. And so I I think we kind of use that narrative in our industry. But I just had a call in from Central Alberta and said the same thing. It was a million bucks for a quarter section of land that would never pay for itself. And then you come over here to Saskatchewan and. It's 400,000, we think that's crazy. And so everybody feels that the land, price of land is offside. It, it does tie into though what we're seeing at FCC and, and frankly what we're resourcing is this uh, business skill development for farmers. And I think in the next 10 years, I'm seeing way more ambition and interest from the farming community to increase their game in terms of business acumen. Uh, and that might be you know the CFO side starting to operate like a, like a true financial officer the marketing side, the, the operations or the production side, and, and really starting to take these farms, which are no longer small little mom and pop businesses. These are big enterprises that would rival any company I would meet in downtown Toronto. So, you know, I don't know, is your observation the same? You see this trend of the appetite for business acumen. Maybe even our agrologist friends listening here see that and the role for advisors in that process. Yeah, well, I don't know if there's a 
it's hard to say if it's a trend or not. I think it's a necessity almost though. Like, you know, and I get to talk to lots of farmers across the country as you do, Marty, um, both, you know, just personally and in, in my job, you know, those numbers get bigger. You just, you have to sharpen your pencil. You have to become a better operator. The, you know, and we know maybe on the financial side of it, we, we ask for more info. We want, you know, we want to lend money to the best operator. You know, any bank needs, needs a return, right? So, I think as um, as farming gets more sophisticated, the management practices have to keep pace with that. And I, I kind of think first, you know, I should back up too. If uh, if there's farmers out there, people out there keeping using an Excel spreadsheet or a pen and paper to keep their records, that by no way do I means they're a bad farmer, a bad record keeper, a bad yeah. manager. In fact, probably the opposite. You know, um, I've seen some some written records that are just phenomenal. Like they have, you know it doesn't make a, a, a judgment on their management uh, discipline or their management ability at all. It's just, it's hard to do something with that data on a year over year comparative basis or benchmark or, you know, when it's not digitized, right? And, it, and it's way more work too. Like it's way more work to keep something. It might seem like it's easier in the moment, but way more work after the fact to get that handwritten note uh, into something that makes sense and, and is usable. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of think farm management practices, as management practices in any industry, Marty, yeah, as your business grows, your your management practices have to grow with it. Yeah, I'm seeing way more peer groups pop up again. And I remember those popular when I first left university was the idea of peer groups. And then we kind of, I don't know, maybe they didn't, they fell out of fancy and now they're back. Um, and some really good examples in some of the transition conversations I've heard about, you know, once a year, the lawyer, the accountant, the agronomist, and all the stakeholders in the family business come to the table to sort of make a collective decision of what's best. And I'm seeing more of that too. And I think that speaks to the sophistication of, of the modern farmer and the sophistication of the businesses where, where one person alone can no longer keep all the balls in the air. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree with that. We haven't had okay. a disagreement yet, Marty. I'm kind of disappointed. Oh, dang. Well, okay, then we're getting to my favorite subject. This is the future of food. Then we'll kind of move into our last chapter, Darcy, about food trends, etc. And I spent a lot of time in this. Yeah. Before you do, there is one question on the on the chat board about data ownership. Do you mind if I just speak to that quickly? Yeah, go for it, Darcy. Yeah, this is a great question um, by I think it was Forrest. Um, just about data ownership. So we've taken the position at you know at Egg Expert uh, to become egg data transparent. So really, what that means is. We follow a, a set of, um, I guess, dis or discipline ourselves. Really, our, the farmers own their data in our system. We consider ourselves stewards of their data for them. Um, they own it. They get to choose who they share it with. They get to choose who they don't share it with. If they share it to somebody and they change their mind, they can withdraw that sharing. So yeah, it's a good question on, on data ownership. And I think it's an important one and it's an important reason why Maybe some farms are hesitant or some operators are hesitant to put their data out on the on the interwebs. Uh, but I think it's an important question and I think the egg data transparency seal is our way of of ensuring our customers know that hey, actually the data is yours, it's not ours. We don't share it with anybody. We can't we you know we we treat it like it's an individual farm's trade secrets. That said, on the flip side, we also know that we need to let farmers share that data. Uh, you know that that's the whole point of it right so there's no good to and well I guess I shouldn't say there's no good but the good is really limited if you just enter your data on our solution and never share it or never use it um, that's you know the whole point is is to be able to share or use that data with other systems to to make your farm more profitable or to to do things that you know before might have taken you eight or nine hours to fill out your crop insurance report you can do it now in a click of a button it's about more about efficiency that's a great point and i i'm with you darcy i think i think the philosophy you guys have led on the data transparency is an anchor and so i've watched the industry um embrace that and look at it deeper and so i still think the data things on the early part of the conversation as the industry i don't think we've resolve this necessarily and and we could spend the next 30 minutes talking about data ownership boundaries etc but I, I think it's a really wise question that came and i i had a chance to pull up the q a here and steve had a question about labor um i think we can deal with it right now to um you know how do we fight how do we uh solve the availability of qualified labor um 
I don't, I think that's a, that's an interesting question to me is how do we attract people to work in this space and whether it's at the production side or whether it's further up the value chain to, you know, to do the support roles that exist in the industry too. Um, my thoughts on this is, um, one, we need to make the industry more inviting. And I, I've challenged my own paradigms on this is I use some weird language. And so agriculture is intimidating if you're not from our shop and you're talking, if you're in the cattle business, you have bulls and steers and heifers. And that seems like normal language for us, but it's not for other people. And if I look at the complexity in, in terms of language of cover cropping and zero tilling and, and even how, what we call equipment, it's not super inviting. And so I think we've got to at least set the stage so people feel welcome to work in this space. And I actually think the piece we have the most control of is how we speak about our industry. I am a huge advocate of when I turn on my social media feed and all I see is negativity around the sector, what's going wrong. Um, it's actually not a very inviting industry to join. Like if I think of a parallel like tourism, do you ever see the tourist people saying, ah, don't come to Banff, it's snowing, it sucks. And, and so if you just use that lens when we're creating our own content and messaging, it starts to look more inviting. Um, and you know that doesn't solve the idea of how do I get somebody to move to Aneroid, Saskatchewan to work on a grain farm. I, I appreciate we have the regionality and the geography distance, but I think we, the things we can control is how we position our industry as hugely opportunistic, lots of growth here, good jobs. It's been reasonably recession proof through this last 12 months, which means it should be a pretty attractive space. Um, those are a few thoughts I had, Dars. Yeah, I agree. I agree, Marty. I think. Um... You know, maybe where we work, and I, I can't remember, I just watched a, a podcast with somebody, a big, a larger farmer, um, talk a lot about culture, right? And culture is big. You have to have that open culture where you're, you know, where people want to work and they see it as a, you know, an employer of choice. And I, I think overall as the industry, we probably have some work to do to make sure people see possibilities in egg careers. Um, I don't know if they do right now. Like if you're not in from agriculture, I don't know if you'd look at that as a, hey, I'm going to go work for a farmer or go work for a feedlot um, or, you know, a food processing company. Maybe food processor would be a little bit different, but yeah, I don't I don't think they see that or they don't even know what the opportunities are. So we probably have some work as an industry to to do that. And then as individual, as we hire people, we got to make sure we have a good culture. People are taken care of. They feel like, you know, it, it's a, a place they want to, they see a future or, or a, a future career for them and, you know, ultimately their families too. Okay, Darcy, so we're getting to kind of the end of our um, sort of calculated time before we go to the Q&A, but I do want to spend a few minutes on uh, future of food. And if you're listening to this and can get access to the Nourish Food Report, it's my fun report that I read every year that's kind of got the softer side of where food trends are going. And there's a few I want to seed with the, the room because it makes great coffee room talk, but also might drive some questions, is I see, you know, if I play this out opportunity in agriculture, um, biodegradable plastics or plant-based packaging is going to be a new opportunity for the industry. When we're done with COVID and we start to get healthcare on track, we're going to have honest conversations about health. We're going to have lots of conversations about climate and environment and what can we do. I think there's an opportunity inside of this for agriculture to look at alternative packaging and the likelihood that they come from plant byproducts is pretty real. I don't, corn would be the most likely because of the amount of acres in the U.S. But I think, I think there's something there. Um, I think there's another thing going on around uh, social justice around food, which is what this report identified that I really keyed on. And um, the idea that people are going to, um, oh, I see Ian just populated the chat with the link to Nourish report. Thanks, Ian. Um, social justice on food. And this is, I have this theory, there's this momentum that says we're going to eat with our families more and moving forward because we did this last year. We really enjoyed the family experience, dining together, learning to cook. I. I actually don't think that sticks. And the reason I don't is I've got two kids, 14 and 12. And the second that sports fires up again, we're gonna be racing between meals, you know, catching fast food on the way. And so I think some of those old traditions in society will come back. Um, but what, 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 which social justice will stick will be the environment, climate and sustainability. That is, that is the one consumer movement that we see really anchoring and, uh, and taking hold as the next conversation. Darcy, so what's your thoughts on future of food, sort of where you see things headed? Yeah, similar to you, Marty. I think um, the sustainability uh, issue isn't, or I shouldn't say issue, the sustainability questions aren't going away from consumers. And um, it's going to take a lot of work for this industry to make sure people feel 
knowledgeable um, about where their food comes from and how it how it was uh, raised or how it was grown or what was applied to it. Um, you know, and it, it's just it, it's such a big big topic that I think it's it's inevitable and. You know, and you've opened my eyes many times to even your kids being in those teen years. They care about that stuff. Like I, when I was 13, 14, 15, my food came from the deep freeze, which came from, you know, my Holstein steer that I built. You know, you had, I had, never really thought about it, never really cared if I went to McDonald's and they had styrofoam. It wasn't, wasn't a thing when we were growing up. Uh, now it's a, it's a major topic. And, you know, we talk a lot about, um, and, you know, in our, or at least in, in my division, we talk a lot about giving farmers a reason to collect and share their data. And I think some of that sustainability or how it was raised uh, question is, is a big reason. Sharing that along the value chain so that consumers feel safe and confident and telling our story better as an industry. And I know, I think we've done an okay job telling our story, but you know, it's one of the things we have to combat is we can tell a thousand positives and somebody tweets something that catches fire. Uh, and just as an industry, we have to be better prepared to to have answers readily available to maybe calm the, calm the flames. Well, I think the other catalyst that, that a lot of people may not see happening is this ambition or passion on ESG-based goals in corporations. So environmental, social, and governance-based uh, goal setting. And last year in the US, it attracted $27 billion of new investment. And so if you just, have a theory like I do, if you follow the investment ambitions, if investors are flocking to ESG based initiatives, it would only make sense to me that in our sector, we're going to be hit with the, the expectation that we're playing all in on on having good governance. And that, that for those of you who aren't familiar with it, that's separation of your president from your uh, or your board chair from your president. It's turning this separation in terms of how we're structured socials, how we treat our people. Back to the labor question, are we inviting as an industry? And then environmental, that's been the one we talk about the most. Um, but I, I just think that investment attraction is going to start to pull us along. Ian, I see we're kind of uh, pushing on the edges of our time. So I'll maybe allow you to interject here to see if you want to keep going or how we want to proceed. Yeah, I think we're good, uh, gentlemen. Um, we got a couple questions on the floor. I've, I've generated some questions myself uh, from some of your discussions, both both on uh, the data side as well as uh, on the future side of uh, food security and production. Yeah, maybe another five minutes, and then uh, I can uh, bring on some of the more d discussion points uh, or questions from the floor. Okay, um, Darcy, from your standpoint, you know, I get you and I debate the cellular meat thing. Um, I see pros and cons in that, right? We, there's the, there's the plant-based burger side. And I think Saskatchewan has an inherent conflict on that one where we've got huge constituent growing plant proteins, and then we have a huge constituent growing animal proteins. And, um, so we sit in this weird spot, us in Manitoba in particular. So where do you see cellular meat going? And that's the true lab-based meat. Yeah, that's a good question, Marty. You know, my feelings, I am an old cattle producer. It used to be uh, an old cattle producer. And um, I guess people, I just want to give people, if people want to eat cellular meat or meat or grown in a lab, I guess give them the choice. Uh, let's just meet, make sure everything is uh, treated fairly and equally in the same rigor that's put on on traditionally made food. Or if you look at, you know, beef or, or you know, any anything that we raise here um, in Saskatchewan as, as the same rigor of any of these new entrants into the food market, right? So yeah if, yeah, if somebody wants to eat meat in the lab, I guess hats off to you, but let's not assume that it's more healthy or, you know, more safe. It's like, let's treat everything on a level playing field and, and really make sure consumers know both sides of the story. Yeah, I, I, those of you that, some of you on this line will probably know this, but the UN food summits this summer and, uh, and so lots of conversations about where does the UN go with their recommendations on on eating any food category in particular meat will be the target because the the un has already shown some signals that they want to shift to a plant-based based diet i just learned this morning that part of that signal there's a nuance in it is that um, developed nations uh, would be well served to eat a little bit less meat but developing nations would be well served to eat more meat which is an interesting dichotomy we've got here on the planet and how we're going to write the circle on this one um, insect protein uh darcy you're a big fan of crickets 
Hey, it's a great. I was reading a little bit about this actually the last uh, the last couple of months. Um, hey, out, out, elsewhere they eat they eat insects and all kinds of different things and seem to be fine. So if once again if if there's a if there's a market and people want to eat it and it's safe and it's the nutritional value is clearly articulated. I guess uh, go with it. I'm personally probably not going to pass up a steak for a grasshopper like leg or something. But hey, you know, as um, food food habits change, food changes. You know, my my food diets changed a lot from growing up on the farm to moving, you know, to more trying different foods. So I wouldn't I wouldn't say no to it. But uh, I don't know how I don't know how if it's going to be lasting in North America anyways, or a harder road probably in the Western world. Yeah, I think. I think insect protein shows up in protein shakes and other places where it can be buried in the list of ingredients. Um, I did have a chance to, to eat uh, crickets once as a kind of a social experiment when I was at Agribition, which of course my cattle friends weren't too passionate about me eating the cricket thing. But my experience was, Steve, that um, they tasted like corn nuts with a side of dirt. Like at first they were crunchy and kind of, oh, that's neat. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden, it just had this dirt aftertaste. So I don't think we'll get over the ick factor in terms of my local community and people engaging in it. But as I see um, pet food, great opportunity there, as somebody uh, pointed out here in the in the chat room. But to Darcy's point, I think in other markets, it's been a very relevant source of protein. And so we would be foolish not to engage in it. Um, but I'm with Darcy. I think the social side, I've always said that after some trade mission work we did in Asia, that I think developing nations, it's a status symbol to eat fresh meat. And so I always think we don't pay enough attention to the social cues in society about what people really want versus what the data says. And so if I've worked my whole life to better my family and I have a chance to finally eat a piece of pork or a piece of meat, I'm probably going to do that as a status symbol. And in Canada, then you have just the legacy of the, um, is that food palatable or is there an ick factor to it? Um, Ian, why don't I turn it back to you or uh, or we can, yeah, I'll let you mo maybe moderate from here. Sure, absolutely. Well, once again, uh, very much thanks to you, Marty and Darcy, for this extremely interesting and relevant topic. Uh, first off, I love the statement, if something is simple, can we make it simpler? And if you guys don't mind, uh, I might borrow that in some of my applications. I, I quite like that. I think it's relevant to not only agriculture, but all walks of life. So uh, I, 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 I it's one of my uh, take homes that, that I, uh, I took from your, your meeting. Um, I think you've answered most of the chat questions. Uh, it got me thinking about some of the other sort of questions that I can maybe put on and, and get your, your sense and discussions on. Uh, first one, a bit of a loaded question, uh, given uh, the province's failed carbon tax argument with the federal government, but how do you see carbon sequestration uh, impacting Canadian farmers now and potentially in the future? Marty? <laughs> yeah, he's going to defer to me. I knew he would. Um, yeah, okay, so loaded question. Um, so I'll, I'll take, I think you got to take the politics off the table here. Uh, one, in terms of the audience, Darcy and I sitting here is, you know, frankly, federal crown employees. This is an awkward one. But I can offer this, because I'm an inherent opportunist, is I actually about a year and a half ago shift my perspective on carbon and went, hey, wait a minute, there's an asset here for us as an industry. And so first thing is, I've been working hard on the comm side to say, Canadian farmers are not environmental pirates. We actually do a lot of really good things. We just, frankly, we're bad storytellers, honestly. We, we've we got a good story to tell. So we got to start there. The second one is, I a, a year ago, a year and a bit ago, Michael McCain was in a room that I was with. And Michael McCain's the president of uh, Maple Leaf Foods. And um, he said, hey, we want to be carbon neutral and we want to buy offsets to to be able to make a statement. At the same time, Microsoft had, had done a similar announcement said, we're gonna go carbon neutral all the way back to the time we incorporated. So I look at this as more of an opportunity for the industry to say, there's external groups that would like to invest in neutrality. And so they need to buy their way through the offset. But there are many streams within agriculture that would offer them that privilege. Cause today they have to do that through solar wind farms, forestry. Um, yeah, they've got a few channels. So to me, Ian, the opportunity here, regardless where you sit on carbon, is I see a new revenue stream. And frankly, that's what gets me excited. There's lots of headwinds, I guess pun intended, of what's getting in the way of us getting that done. 
Um, but it does get me inspired to why I need to digitize my records too. Because if I want to start to participate or play in some sort of data exchange, the digitization recipe starts to come up again and again and again. Darcy, what, what do you think? No, that's. Uh, I'm glad you went first, Mark. Help me collect my thoughts, actually, because you do. You know, and just the group that we're um, presenting to today, um, agro agrologists really help Canadian farmers um, use be more efficient. You know, make more efficient use of materials, fertilizers, inputs, all the things that are you know carbon intensive. Um, the voluntary market seems like it might be a better way of, of trying to capitalize on that from farms in the, in the short term not in, until the whole you know until we shake down what all the new protocols are and um you know to see a, you know to, if if there's going to be a ton of value at the farm gate um but yeah i think carbon carbon's going to have some dollar or price tag associated to it i think the the question is how much and um, how is it going to be applied and how can farmers participate in carbon markets? And that, you know, that'll get shaken out in the next year or so. Yeah, I agree, I agree with you there. And, I, you know, there was the link here in the chat around the latest Western Producer article, no credit for no-till. Um, you, you know, from my standpoint, the other language I'm hearing from food retail is this idea of continuous improvement. So. I think at a minimum as an industry to adopt the philosophy of we're going to continuously get better at these things. Um, that's an expectation of, of the consumer and they don't tell us how much we need to improve. We don't have to improve 10, 20, 30 percent. But the philosophy that when we go to work every day, kind of what you said earlier, Darcy, that farmers are always trying to be more efficient. They're always trying to find ways to do things better. Um, we got to share that. We got to articulate that if, if, um, if we want to get credit for some of the good work that we've done. Yeah. So, gentlemen, uh, where do you see the one biggest opportunity for Western Canadian farmers based on the current food trends you're seeing? I, I can kind of, well, I think I have mine, Marty, if you want some time to think about yours. I think it's this whole notion of food provenance, proving where your food came from, being able to trace back from, you know, the grocery aisle right down to the farm or the you know the producer that made that food and trying to add some value on that value chain and i think um you know that's one of our biggest reasons why we're trying to help farmers just digitize that field data so i think that's going to be that data right now to me is what's very valuable as some of these new value chains uh, appear as, as consumers really start demanding for it i think there's some there's some untapped potential in having that food provenance um that chain of, you know, I guess that chain of um, uh, provenance proven from field or right from the farm to consumer. Actually, it's kind of ironic you say that, Darcy, because I my nuance on that is the is the sort of macro side of it is this massive interest in buying local, and so I know that Saskatchewan is is export centric, and I I actually love that about Saskatchewan. But it's, when I think about the leader in Canada around ambitions by government to to buy and support local, it's Quebec. Quebec actually put some goals together and said, today I, th I think their numbers like forty nine or fifty percent of their food is is sourced locally. They want to go to fifty six percent in whatever that runway is, say five years. Um, that's the opportunity, and and so to me, any time that we can produce or create a label that just says, hey, made in Canada. The Canadian Center for Food Integrity's research says buy local for most Canadians doesn't mean buying at the farmer's market. It means, you know, buying Canada. That's that's ex that's generally accepted as local. So if it's BC fruit, uh, if it's a Saskatchewan pulse or Alberta beef, all of those things have a lo have a localness to them because they're made in Canada. And so if I had to be an opportunist is Darcy needs traceability, the Providence side of things. To be able to demonstrate that i'm saying putting a label on it it offers canada a differentiator in terms of breaking the tie we still have to be competitive it doesn't allow us to extract 10 percent premium across the board but if anything COVID and supply chain pressure taught us was canadians ambition to try to support local excellent thank you gentlemen i throw maybe one larger scale question last sort of thoughts on it global climate change the effect over the next, say, 25 years for food production and food security, what are your thoughts? 
I'll probably take a run at that from a high level is, you know, 20 years ago, I was sitting in a room with a guy named John Oliver and John was an old uh, Dow uh, senior person. He might've even been the Canadian director at the time, but he introduced me to water and the idea of water scarcity. And this was 20 years ago. And uh, talking about the Corn Belt moving north, because uh, as things get hotter, uh, we'll just say towards the equator, if you use that in general, is, you know, Canada's opportunity is we have all this fresh water. And so we'll likely have improvements in plant breeding to allow us to, to grow these crops. Um, so if I was to really look at it, I would say your question about climate change and is as things, as it gets harder to grow crops in developing nations, this is our opportunity uh, because Canada's advantage is I've always said we need to be best in class in protein. If Canada had a call to action is we want to be when you when someone in Canada said, or someone around the world says Canada, I want them to say, oh, that country, they know protein, animal protein, plant protein. That's what we do. We're not going to win the starch wars because they can grow rice and corn in huge volumes in other parts of the world. So let's own the protein market around the world. And so I think about your question, kind of linking it to climate change is other countries struggle to grow high quality protein. That's that's our runway. That's our lane. And we need to collectively show up in all regions, in all commodity groups, saying we're best in class in protein. Yeah, as much as it pains me, I have to agree with Marty. I wouldn't come up with a better, <laughs> better answer. I think we have a ton of opportunity to prove that Canada has a unique competitive advantage in the way we produce protein. Um, unique pretty much to any other place in the world. Lots of land, small population. Um, and I think if we can, you know, do a better job of proving that or, or marketing it, I think there's tons of opportunity for, for Canada to be seen as that leader. No, those are great answers, Marty and Darcy. I'll, I'll throw sort of the last one and then we'll wrap up. Um, given that this is the uh, AGM for agrologists, what what role does agrologists have in what you described uh, going into the future with the protein and other agricultural and environmental aspects? Uh, in particular, what, what role does agrologists uh, and th this field and profession have within Saskatchewan? Yeah, I'll take a run at that. I um, I think I think we all of us on this call. I I'm not an, an SIA member, but I think we have a responsibility to stretch the minds of our audience, and that in this case might be the farm groups that we're working with, uh, farmers. This might be policymakers. But I honestly think what you guys are doing here with continuing education credits and trying to expand is, is I actually really believe I have a responsibility to take that out to the masses and scale that because people like my dad at home farming don't necessarily have access to the thought leaders that are on this call. Um, and so so to me, if we could do anything as, as, a, as a greater membership is to, is to not leave what you heard here today packaged up in a tidy little webinar, but try to wait, find a way to put your own words and scale it. I think that's that's our opportunity. Yeah, maybe a, on a little different vein than Marty. I think when I when I talk about um, people that can make complex problems, explain complex problems simply, I think that's in the farming or agriculture world. Um, that's where agrologists come in. You know, the the topics that uh, you guys all all of you have to deal with, they're complex. They're you know <laughs> they're heavy topics, uh, and to be able to you know, to boil them down to something that's good for a for a farmer and industry, I think is key to all of this, whether it's plant breeding, soil science, environmental climatology, you know, agrologists are really at the end of the day, um, kind of scientists or experts in a, in a lot of these things. And um, yeah, we're, we're definitely, you, you know, play a key role. You all play a key role, I think, in helping, you know, prove out or do a lot of things that Marty and I were talking around, not just around technology, but around you know, helping people understand, you know, how agriculture works. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. I mean, the data to carbon to climate change to food production. I mean, our, our bookends were huge and you guys brought so much uh, dynamics to this. And, and uh, you know, I, I love the, the playoff of one another. And uh, thank you so much, Marty. Thank you so much, Darcy. Uh, we very much appreciate it, and um, I guess from my standpoint, I'll, I'll bring it over to uh, back back to SAA. And um, yeah, thank you so much.